There we go. So we're here together for finding your organization's authentic voice and your own. I am leading the training, Elon Eleven. I am program director at New Media Mentors. I've been teaching digital strategy since, I mean, I don't know, 2006, basically, because uh, part of that first wave of people who started doing digital for nonprofits, and we were teaching ourselves as we went. And so I was always called upon to lead trainings and I love it. And I'm so glad that now I get to just do this as my full-time job. Um, I've worked a lot in labor. I was the first digital staff person for a lot of unions, um, worked for most recently for Make the Road New York, which is New York's largest immigrant community organization. And I co-founded Organizing 2.0, which is an annual training conference held in New York, but past two years have been entirely online. That's just for digital strategy trainings for organizers. Um, so I'm really excited that through Media Mentors, I get to teach digital strategy full time year round. I have a webinar starting next week on all fundraising, actually, with my friend Raz. And um, I'm going to share some sign up information for that if you're interested later. But that's who I am. And we've been we've been teaching digital strategy as webinars since before COVID. We've got we've got this pretty well under our belt and we're excited to have so many more people getting interested in this work now. It's definitely necessary. So today we're going to start by talking about what we mean by having an authentic voice. I'll have a lot of examples. We're going to go over a worksheet and we're going to have plenty of time for Q&A because 90 minute training, who has heard of such a thing? So rare. Do you remember this meme? There was a meme that was like, I have a joke about X but blah, blah, blah. It was, um, when was this? This meme was from July of 2020. <laughs> My tweet will tell me this. Does anybody remember that? Does anybody remember that meme? If any of you guys participated in, in it, let me know. Um, but my version of it was, I have a joke about running digital for a nonprofit, but it has to go through five senior staffers for approval, at which point any personality or humor will be removed and the topic will be out of date. Uh, this might be a little bit too relatable to those of us who work in the nonprofit space. 525 likes, not bad. Um, you know, I one of the very first battles I ever had to deal with in digital was getting my organization bought into the idea that digital mattered. And a piece of that was getting them to understand that you have to talk like the, in you have to talk like a human being to succeed on the internet. Um, one way to think about getting that permission from within your organization is to approach it like an organizing campaign. Who are the influence, who are the opinion leaders that are gonna get the people in charge to listen to you? Whose opinions do they respect? And one thing I know is that when you tell people you learned something at a training, especially if it's a training that work sent you to, that's often very good. Uh, I'm trying to think of less violent language, but it's often a pretty good weaponry to stand up with when you begin a fight to get permission to do your to do your job well, right? So if at the end, as you're as you're listening to this training, if you keep finding yourself saying, "Oh, they'll never let me do that," just remember you can like literally go back to your boss and say at the training at Netroots Nation, which is a thing you sent me to because this is the best place to get trained, they talked about this. Here are some examples of what other groups are doing and the success they've had. And that can be a good model to move from. So what is the tone that we are rebelling against? This is a press release, pretty normal press release. I find it slightly funny that the subject is how they are utilizing natural language processing to improve the member experience. I know that natural language processing is a specific thing, but it's funny to have someone talk about natural language processing in language that does not sound natural. Uh, so this is a press release. You know, before I was doing digital organizing, I did traditional communications and I also did field organizing. And um, this is a press release. I guess press releases are still good for things. You know, I know a lot of people whose primary way of accessing reporters is through Twitter, frankly, but I'm sure this is a perfectly fine press release, I guess. Oh, I'm sorry. But this is not a good tweet. If this was a tweet, this would not be good. And people are in the habit of posting press releases to Twitter all the time. And look, not every tweet you post is going to be a great one, but we're here to make sure that some of them are good because when you have some good ones, even your less good ones will perform better. 
Uh, or one way to think about it is next time you have to post a press release, you can link to it. Twi the tweet that is the header for it needs to sound like it's coming from a person and it needs to have urgency and feeling. So let's look at two different tweets about World Mental Health Day. Um, one of them is from a massive NGO that none of you work for, so hopefully you won't mind that I have like a thing critical of them. And to your right, you'll have a tweet from one of my favorite members of the New York State Senate. Now, the difference is very, very vast. Um, I do want to say I'm glad that the tweet at left is using two hashtags because tweets should never use more than two hashtags. Tweets with more than two hashtags underperform all the time by every metric. Um, but anyway, it's very formal. It's not interesting. It doesn't speak like a person. And look at that image. That image is like the most obvious clip art thing you could possibly use. It doesn't really even add anything. To your right, local elected official. I love this message. Happy World Mental Health Day. Meditation is good, but the single most meaningful thing we can do in New York to make quality mental health care accessible is pass the New York Health Act. A healthcare system that isn't universal does not prioritize mental health. You know, if I was writing the tweet for her as a staffer, and I don't, I think she just wrote this herself because she does her own Twitter, I would have made a, it hashtag World Mental Health Day because that was a trending hashtag. I wouldn't have done like a million hashtags in the tweet, but I would have done that one. However, the tone of this is just. And I mean, obviously, when you're a person speaking as a person, like she's an elected speaking as an elected, it is easier to sound like a natural human being than it is when you are a massive NGO. But um, that's one of the reasons why it's really good for us. Uh, I'm going to go here. Wait, where is it? That's why it's. Whoop. Right. That's why it's really good for us to also be able to tweet as ourselves. Um, I have had my own Twitter account active since 2008, since I had to like Lee text message from my non smartphone in order to tweet live from the DNC. Um, and through all the jobs I have had since 2008, I have had my Elon underscore Brooklyn Twitter handle with me. It's actually too long to be a Twitter handle by the current rules, but I'm grandfathered in. And um, as I worked from labor to an immigrant community group, I still continue to tweet about my work and the issues I care about, as well as all my like nerd culture stuff. Um, and the following that I've grown at each of these jobs has followed me from one job to the next. I've seen too many people make up Twitter handles where it's like their name and their organization's name. And unless you're like the president of that organization or the official spokesperson, you're much better off having your Twitter handle be yourself. And then you can say in your bio, if you'd like, that you work for a particular organization and tag the organization. But you want your Twitter identity to be you and you want it to travel with you everywhere you work and be helpful to it. And, you know, there's definitely stuff I don't talk about on Twitter because I am there in a sort of semi-professional piece. You know, I have a lot of friends who are artists and there's some art that they make that I won't reshare because I think that somebody could be scandalized by it or whatever. But I'll tell you what I do tweet about from my own account, which is clearly related to my work. I'll tweet promotions about my comics podcast, where I talk about the intersection of comics and politics. And I'll tell you, my Twitter account is the only reason that a lot of people in New York know who to vote for. A lot of people, sorry, from the comic book community specifically, know who to vote for in like a district leader race, a very local nerdy race that nobody follows. It's because I got the Venn diagram of the comics nerds and the local politics. I'm existing right in the middle of it. And I'm going to have both audiences be reached through it. So, you know, we all manage organizational Twitter accounts, but it's great when we also can do our own. Um, and uh, if you tweet as yourself, throw your handle in the chat because we should all be following each other. Moving right back here. I should say this is a brand new training. So this is all a little bit like we're seeing how this works. Um, I want to share a tweet that has some personality. It's brought to you by the state of New Jersey. If the state of New Jersey can have a Twitter account with personality that sort of speaks from the New Jersey soul, then your organization can also have a Twitter account that speaks from the organization's soul. Um, it's extremely New Jersey. They pump, because you're not allowed to pump your own, if, I'm like for people who don't live in the East Coast, you're not allowed to pump your own gas in New Jersey. So that's why it's pump your, pump your own gas at zero times. It's like the most New Jersey way to be. Um, and, you know, New Jersey, they're in conversation with Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania, very much speaking with the Pennsylvania cuisine voice to shout out pierogies. And then New Jersey, 
uh, because, you know, different driving laws in New Jersey and PA are in the same lane a lot. Honk, honk, get out of the left lane. And like, look, New Jersey sounds like New Jersey. That is like the spirit of New Jersey. And I've been really interested in seeing in the ways everything from localities, you know, they, they, brands were doing this before anybody else. And that's ridiculous because brands don't actually have members. They don't actually represent people. We do. So that's why I want to point out that having authenticity in your communications isn't just about style or about writing things that will lead to virality. It's about capturing the urgency of your members' voices. I mean, yes, if you do these things well, you'll also have more style and your stuff might perform better. But if you can't speak from your members' voice, you're not really doing them justice because you're doing what we would call um, third partying. In labor, we have an expression called don't third party the union. That means when you're talking about the union, the members are the union. So like this tweet from the farm workers, it says, tomorrow when you close the windows, filter the air and still have food to eat, that's us. Hashtag we feed you. Not they feed you, we feed you because we are the union, right? Don't third party the union, don't third party your organization. Your members are your organization, you're your organization. I know one of the folks here is starting a new organization. You, you still are thinking about it through the lens of who are your members and how are you speaking as them? So one of my suggestions would be to think about your membership. Who's your prototypical member? Who's someone who's the heart and soul of your organization? Who's that staff person who really represents who the membership is or who you want them to be, who you'd like your membership to grow to be? Um, and they exemplify your organization and their values. And I want you to write in their voice. And this is something that you can do by literally write, working with them. Certainly, if you're an organizer, I mean, it's a huge compliment to hear from someone saying, hey, I really feel like you are the voice of our organization in terms of understanding our values and representing our community. I want to talk with you about how we represent ourselves on social media, because I think you will help us speak about this. And I want to see what you're posting. How do you talk about the issues? Look at the emails that they write. When they talk about the organizations work online, what is the language they're using? And put yourself in their shoes and write things with them. You know, they might not be as savvy about social media usage from the standpoint of, for example, they might use 50 different hashtags in a tweet, which you're not supposed to. And us as digital strategists know not to do that. But we might not be like, I'm not, you know, an immigrant community member from who like was raised in the Dominican Republic and is active in Make the Road New York. But I know like who is, and I'll partner with her in between my knowing how Twitter works best and seeing how she writes and talks authentically about the community. It's like a team up of beautiful success. Um, so when you're thinking about tone, you don't want to sound like a robot and you also don't want to sound inauthentic. Um, there's a reason that that Steve Buscemi gif is still relevant. You know, you don't want to be fake. If you are not a hip and young organization, don't pretend to be. That's okay. It's okay not to be. But speak like your members. Speak to your members. One way you can determine how that is, is to follow your members on social media. Now, you can do this from your own account, which is a great way to start. Um, start by thinking about who are the people that are members that are like your big super volunteers who show up at everything. You have a CRM. Go and take a look at who oh, who clicks to who. If you're like a more digital organization and you don't know who all your members are face to face, see who your most active supporters are. Look them up on Facebook and Twitter. Follow them on Twitter. Facebook is more personal; they might not want you there. But on Twitter, if they see the organization they like are a member of us following them on Twitter, that's like an honor. You're, you're recognizing their activism. Um, another way to make sure you're able to do this is to ask people for handles on their sign up forums. And make sure that your organization is replying to people who comment on your Facebook page and respond to your tweets. So many groups don't do this. So, you know, social media, it's about two-way communication. It's not about broadcasting. Um, you know, and sometimes when you go to you look and you look to see what your members are sharing, are sharing on social media, it might not be what you expect. You might find some seniors are hipper than you might have expected, or you might see some kinds of GIF formats that you look at and you're like, oh my God, this is the ugliest thing I've ever seen in my life. 
but man, our members are sharing this. So this must, this must speak to them in some way and like understand the aesthetics of the graphics that they're using to speak for themselves. Um, too many organizations just sort of show up and make things that look super corporate and throw branding on everything. And we actually know for a fact that um, digital collateral like graphics and images that don't have logos on them are shared more. So you want your visual, because your visuals are part of your voice, right? You want that to also look like what your members are sharing, not look like some corporate thing that's unrelatable to them. Unless your members are the kind of folks who do go for that corporate field, because there are people for whom that does work, right? It's all about listening to them, seeing what they're sharing. So if you have some favorite social media accounts, would love to see those. I've asked people to share their own as well. Who are some of your members' favorite? I'm not, sorry, this slide's a bit confusing. I'm not asking for you to share your members' Twitter accounts. I'm asking you to share, who does your, who do your members follow? Like, do you, are they all big Lizzo fans? You know, like who are the artists that they're following online? I'd love to see that if you know. So this, this tweet was one of the reasons I decided to do this training. Um, Actually, the one at, the one to the right is the first one I saw. Team Chosoko 804, right when the parliamentarian was like, you can't have immigrant citizenship as part of this package. There are this Teamsters, this tiny Teamsters local in New York saying, what the fuck is a parliamentarian? I love you. Like, this is the voice for the Teamsters. This is the voice you want from the Teamsters Twitter account. And so I went and I looked to see what else they'd written. And I love this one at left. I think this is re relatable for a lot of folks. For the last few holiday seasons, y'all may have noticed people delivering UPS packages out of their own cars. Well, guess what? It violated our contract and it's got to stop. We fight, we win. And then you've got the macho man, Randy Savage, uh, meme at the bottom. Like, oh yeah, brother. And look, I would not have used that particular graphic with my members at the right when I was working for the writers union, I would have, because, you know, WWE isn't union yet. I probably would have used something from a more right from a writer's guild show, but, um, for the teamsters, Macho Man Randy Savage gif, that's like all of us Gen X people were like, I understand, I understand this. This is our language. And, you know, we all grew up watching this Michigas morning on TV and pretending to wrestle. This is a pop culture graphic that connects with the audience. The language is colloquial for them. Um, and the uh, and, and, and it represents sort of how they talk about themselves. Now, the Teamsters members are predominantly not on Twitter themselves. They use Twitter to bring workers' voices and perspectives to the platform, which is where they're able to connect with allies and journalists. But where they do talk to members, that's their Facebook page. Not, I'm sorry, they're, they're on their Facebook page, yes, but also in their Facebook group. They have a private Facebook group. They gave me permission to share a few posts that, that they had. And the voice of the union on the Facebook group is literally the union president. I love this post. Brothers and sisters, the Foster slash Fosterville Follies. Foolishness and fuckery continue under fester and is festering, finagling falsification. Please do not work off the clock. Stop going off online to work for free. Do not do management favors. Here's the thing. I can tell from this, despite the fact I have no idea who this company is, that there's clearly some manager at some company who like the members call fester behind his back. He's probably bald or something. And they're like making a joke about it. They're be speaking with his like earnestly. He is using the f bombs because he is fed up with this. There is some fun alliteration, and this is Vincent Perone speaking as himself to the members in the member space. And this uh, union's Facebook group is extremely successful. More than a quarter of their members are active on it. I wish my union had a Facebook group with more of our members active on it. So you're thinking about you might be bringing certain voices with you to a different platform, like bringing the, the members' voices to Twitter if they're not there. And then on Facebook, which like, if your members are over the age of 30, they're probably on Facebook. Um, 
you know, bringing you, that being a space where you might be speaking directly to the members. And here's the thing, the, uh, the voice and tone across the two accounts in those examples I shared is pretty much the same, but that's not always true and that's okay. Um, you know, the audience of who you're communicating with on Twitter and the people you might be communicating to in a different space, like so long as you believe the same things, it's okay to not have everything be completely the same exact tone and style. There's are different platforms and they have different ways of speaking. Um, I would just say to the folks who mentioned that virtually none of your members are on Twitter, just make sure that you are asking to know that. Um, and Paula, you mentioning that their members who are on Twitter are mostly men and they're using it to follow sports. That's really interesting. It's time to think about what are the, is there an opportunity to live tweet a baseball match together to talk about it from their perspective as fans and as workers? Um, you know, what are the pop culture moments that they're engaging with in that Twitter space and how can you bring work into it to talk with them? Um, so I have an exercise that I'm sharing with you guys. After this, um, there'll be a worksheet. And these are the directions. This is inspired by a worksheet put together collaborative, which is a uh, consultant group founded by my old boss from Unite here when I used to work for the union, Amanda Cooper. Um, and here's their exercise. Put yourself in the shoes of a staffer in your organization who feels like the heart and soul of who you are and what you do. And do this sheet either with them or for them as if your organization was a person. The inspiration that Amanda had for this forum was thinking about the questions they ask you in personals ads. So in a way you're kind of creating a personals dating ad for your organization. The first question is, the first thing people notice about me is, if you invite me to a potluck, I will bring, at a party, I'm the person who is, this is when I added, what movie would we watch together? Or what movie would you host a movie night with your for with your members? But which I don't mean like, we're gonna watch the documentary about our organization. Like, no, no, no. I mean, a movie people wanna watch for fun. Like, what would you guys watch for fun together? And if you're a union, your answer can't just be salt of the earth. You got to have something modern. <laughs> um, the people who share my life should. And if you should mess, you should message me if. Now, the if you, you should message me if should be you should message me if you want to organize in your workplace, bring together veterans to stand for uh, for health care. Like the, you should message me if that's the prompt for the people to take action to get involved in your group. So if you're someone who wants to do this, you should message me. So I'll be sharing a link to that form later. You guys can request access. And I, I want you to sort of keep that form in mind as we go through some examples. So I'm on the steering committee of a group called the Jewish Vote. We are a progressive Jewish New York community organization. And um, we were founded in part because we were tired about people talking about the Jewish vote, like it only cared about Israel, Palestine, and that it was conservative people when most Jews are progressive, ridiculousness. So we we're like doing our own thing. It's been pretty amazing actually. And um, I really liked this email we sent. Subject line, this racist attack ad is designed to scare Jewish voters. Plain, simple, this is not necessarily the subject line I would use when sending it to an audience of people who weren't our members, we know who's on our list, it's fellow Jewish progressives, right? Our branding is very stylish. We use a lot of hot pink. Um, hi, Ilana, I'm gonna show you something pretty outrageous. I was angry when I first saw it, angry about the lies and the fear mocking and racist scare tactics. I angry to see Jews yet again be reduced to a political tool and one issue voting block that only cares about Israel. First I got mad and then I organized. Join me, sign up to phone bank with the Jewish vote this Tuesday. And then they did something. We included an actual image of the attack ad that we're responding to. I'm not sharing that on like on social media. You don't want to build it. But in our in our email group, you can tell people, get that disgust reaction to how offensive this ad is and see the attack ad and then pivot to taking action. We um, kind of think about our voice as like, 
being a funny, urbane, Jewish, of course, very New York. Um, we use a lot of Yiddish and Ladino and, and um, you know, Mizrahi Jewish language idioms in our communications. So I absolutely adore a couple of years. Actually, no, it was, yeah, it was this past spring. We had a, a Dayenu. Um, Dayenu from Passover is a, a song you sing, sing, it would have been enough. And they did a list, we did a, a, we had like a parody of all the things it would have been enough if Cuomo had done the following outrages, each one building on the next. And then on the day that he finally resigned, we gave, we retweeted it with ourselves saying, Dayenu. This might not be intelligible to you if you're not Jewish or spend a ton of time with Jews. And that's okay, because our audience of the people who we're speaking to do understand it. It is our voice and it's our sense of humor. Um, Another way you can really capture the voices of members is to literally have them take over your Twitter account or your Instagram account. Uh, Make the Road, Nevada has a really great job with their Instagram takeovers where members take over the Instagram account and post about their day as their Instagram story. We had the, um, from Jews and for Racial and Economic Justice, we had members do a Twitter takeover. And you can do this without actually giving people the log into your account you can have them tell you, like give you some stuff to post. You should explain to them how long a tweet is or else they will send you their autobiography if you're talking to certain kinds of people. But um, like this is this tweet for this membership drive thread is from my friend Carlin and they straight up talking about their experiences as a queer Jewish person of color and um, why this group is so meaningful to them. And that left, we have a right we are talking about um, may, may Felicia Singe be inscribed and sealed for historic electoral 5782. Like it does literally not get more Jewish than that. Um, and it's to promote one of our canvases supporting her. She is running in Queens. We would still love to have people volunteer for that. Um, so yeah, like you're thinking about the culture and the language. Sometimes that means your language might not be English, right? And it's important to be speaking in the language that people are speaking. Um, and to think about, um, you know, having both English and Spanish interspersed, right? If that is the way your folks are communicating. So I want to, ah, my mouse is much too sensitive right now. Um, I want to show some nice examples of um, posts from going back and forth. Farm Workers Union and Unite Here, the Hotel Worker Union, um, Hospitality Union. We have a selfie, not a selfie, we have like a, a, a candid photo of a worker who's volunteering on the campaign. And United Farm Workers is like building on the urgency of the message that the other union posted. And then they're interacting with each other. They're building the community between them. I do think that one of the big problems that nonprofits have is they only interact with other nonprofits. They don't interact with members enough. But it is also good to build community between the nonprofit groups and be in conversation with each other. Um, I want to go back to. So I want to think about when you're, I mentioned before the uh, Make Through Nevada Instagram account that has members take it over. Um, Parents Together is a great organization and has done really good work in the space of bringing the voices of their members to their TikTok and their Instagram accounts. Um, I will show you, uh, and then the, to the left, we have a slide of the kind of photo that I was regularly getting sent by some of the organizations I worked with in the past, a photo where the, uh, I'm, I'm staging it myself. This is me, but this is like me channeling a bad photo. You have the person in front of a flat up against a white wall. The, their hat is covering their face. They clearly don't want to be seen. Like you can tell when somebody doesn't want to be photographed. And frankly, they look like hostage videos. I can't tell you how many times I asked for an organizer to send me a video from a phone bank our members were doing. Like something legitimately cool and meaningful that our members were doing. Say, hey, can you get me a video from them uh, where they are showing what they're doing? And it's just so clearly that they're miserable doing this video that they don't want to be taking it that they're hiding from the camera. Like I've got an image just sent to me that it looked like this person was like gonna be on a wanted sign. Like, have you seen this man? 
I think one of the things that has changed with COVID is that because people are doing less, you know, people were doing less things in person, they realized that you didn't have to have your hair and makeup perfectly done to do a photo of yourself and to share that online. And you didn't have to be perfectly polished and everything put perfectly put together. And so I find it is easier to get member submissions and uh, supporter submissions of content now than it was before COVID because they understand that you're not trying to make them look like a professional and that um, it's either they share stuff online or they show up in person, right? Or they can do even better, they can do both. Um, so if you're someone who's asked for members to submit stuff before and they didn't, try again, because you might find that that goes differently now. Um, but the solution to getting good content instead of these hostage videos, um, oh shoot, I, I don't have this slide where I want it to be. Um, the solution to getting the good content versus the hostage videos is to have organizers be the people talking to members to get it and to interview questions. Have them say where they are, who they are, where they live, and why does it matter to them? Don't give them a script. Don't give them talking points. I know this is counter to like every other communications training, but we've had so many cases of just we're much too stuck to the script just ha holding up super branded signage, no personality, no authenticity content that goes nowhere. I'd rather have a member be like, not super articulate, but be emotional and real than have them read some freaking talking points. And if somebody does a video for you that is off message in the sense that like, it's offensive or messed up, then you don't have to use it. But start off by trying to actually use their voices. So I love this um, video here. I'm going to see if I can. Are, are you seeing, are you guys seeing, um, are you guys seeing this Instagram right now? Is that what's in your window? Not seeing. Okay, hold on. Let me switch. I think I, I think I know how to do this now. Unshare. And then I'm going to reshare. Okay. Now you should be able to watch this Instagram with me, right? I'm going to mute myself so you can hear the audio. You, 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 you can see, I'm not sorry. When I'm saying you can see it, I'm not saying it's, I haven't hit play yet, but you're seeing the, you're seeing the, um, the, the, the Instagram itself. Yeah, you can see it. Okay, great. Um, I'm going to mute myself and then play the audio. School and listen to your parents. Why is that person sleeping on the sidewalk? Are they poor? Yeah, that's what happens when you don't study hard in school and listen to your parents. I think that person might not have a place to live. That makes me very sad. You know, people become homeless for lots of different reasons. Maybe they're sick or they lost their job and can't find another one. You know what? We should donate supplies or volunteer at a place that works with homeless people. So that video is based on an existing TikTok video meme format. You know, it's got the X's for the bad example. She's showing you don't talk to your kids about poverty like this. And the checks for the, uh, for the ones that are how to talk about poverty with your kids. Um, and the person who made this video is one of the organizers for Parents Together. Her name is um, Nanny and she is you know, the organizing director for the organization. And she just this was like, you know, when I said to my friend who works there, like, who is the voice of like, who is the, who is the, the person who like really the heart and soul voice, like the prototypical member or, or the organization. And she said that she was, um, she's deputy director and she lives in Charlotte with her husband and her two sons. And she just like is that person for the organization. And so how wonderful is it to have that voice for your organization be the one speaking for it? I'm going to share another.
All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for uh, joining us today in this um, Instagram live. As people start trickle in, um, let's just give everyone a couple of minutes. Um, literally, they just have youth members from Make the Road hosting conversations with other youth members and doing info sessions together. And a lot of people watch them and engage with them because they're literally giving the reins for communications over to them. So Instagram is a great place for having those voices because a lot of people are comfortable using it who might not use other platforms. Um, eh, I'm going to go back to share here. Bam. Um, this is a slide I have in pretty much every training I do, which is called Don't Use Stock Photos. Remember that slide from that big NGO earlier where you could just tell it was a stock photo and it's tacky? People can always tell a stock photo when they see it. Um, one of the things I used to do at Make the Road was I would do what I called make your own stock photos, where um, if I had staff members who like, really represented the membership, I would be like, hey, can I get a photo of you? I'm going to take a photo of you phone banking. And then I can use this anytime I talk about our folks doing phone banking. So like, you know, let's say on Wednesday, they're, they're doing a phone bank and the lighting in the room is simply abysmal and we are not going to have a decent photo of it. I can use the stock photo I took to say, thanks, thanks to our members who are phone banking Wednesday because I made my own stock image. And I would save all my stock images on my cell phone and deploy them as needed. You know, you don't want to take a photo of a member at a rally about clean air and then use it for a tweet about how you endorsed a particular politician because the person at the clean air rally might not be there to endorse that other politician. But with staff members, you can just do that kind of thing, right? Um, I have also frequently gone to members and said, please send me art that your children made that we can use for this back to school messaging. Um, and just getting the images and stock images from the members is the only way that it's not going to look, it's, that it's going to look and feel like your members. Another way to get more authentic uh, images during, especially when you can't just be everywhere and do everything, especially with COVID, um, Into Action Lab is a platform that just hires illustrators to make GIFs and graphics for progressive causes. Um, Early in the uh, COVID stick scare, I was I told them I needed a GIF to show somebody text banking because there were no GIFs. They, there were no GIFs for text banking, and I wanted to use GIFs to animate my posts about text banks because human me, the human eye responds to images and people and faces and movement. I needed it, but I had nothing to show, so they just like made me this graphic. They would go, you know, they made to spend rent. They make these really great memes. They are all free for you to use. You can go to their Giphy channel into Action Lab. They have tons of stuff for labor, tons of stuff for the environment, for veterans. Um, they have really good, like, to get out the vote stuff for different states that are connected to the sports teams of those states. And the sports teams and localization branding is really great that they do. So free resources, free art. They have paid the workers. Um, this, for example, this tweet from SEIU, you know, I, I, I would have loved to see this be like an animation, but still like, I think this is a good tweet from the standpoint of speaking in the first person and just saying your point really boldly and emotionally. Black women have cared for this nation and we're tired of justice delayed. It is time to recognize the contributions of hashtag black women care. And it's a link to their act, day of action. Um, do folks remember the PA Treasury Twitter account from a few years ago? When the uh, when it changed hands, they closed the account down. But um, it was the home of amazing content like the following. I don't know if folks remember Fish Tube, but for a while there was like a, a very hypnotic video of fish going through a tube that everybody just couldn't stop watching. I love this a fish tube, but for throwing private equity swindlers out of Pennsylvania and into the ocean. Jeff Bezos is going to spend like a hundred billion blasting his dumb rockets into the sun so he can feel like a god and we're all going to pretend that's cool and normal for an economy. 
again, the state government. If your leadership feels like you can't talk like that and be taken seriously or that it cheapens your work or your message, well, guess what? The PA Treasury account, by speaking like a human being, channeling the spirit of Pennsylvanians, reached 41 million people during the uh, over the lifetime of the account. And reach isn't everything. Reach doesn't mean much. In fact, engagement mentions is what matters. And people were actually engaging with the account, so much so that 80, 843 people DM'd them asking for help during the pandemic. And they answered every one of them. Uh, and they were able to push other departments to but to often they don't always get their issues resolved. So like if there were, if somebody was having a problem with the DMV, they might tweet it at PA Treasury and PA Treasury would be like, DMV, this guy's got a problem. Can you help him? Um, sounding like a human means other people will treat you like a human also. Um, I love this from, uh, speaking of fish tubes, we have the farm workers getting in the fish tube spirit by showing people uh, their members harvesting carp. Um, you know, jumping in a popular uh, meme with some union memorabilia that is directly related to it from the 60s and 70s. Um, as my friend Elizabeth from Farm Workers says, you can go off topic if you can still be on brand. And by brand, I don't mean you put your logo all over it, but I mean you have your organization's particular take or analysis show through in it. Now, one of the questions that I hear most when I talk to organizations about making a shift to sound like people is, wait, ah, Ugh, I'm sorry. I'm still getting a handle on how these slides are organized. I will get to that point in a moment. Okay, got a quiz. I've kind of spoiled it already, but pretend you didn't see it. Who tweeted this? What's your best guess? You don't have to name the specific organization, but like, what kind of organization tweeted this or what kind of person, like elected official, activist, like who, who tweeted this? I want to see your guesses. And I don't expect anybody to get it exactly right unless it's because you happen to see me through my slides too quickly. I'm just trying to get a sense of it. It, it sure looks like a union. Yes, yes. And boy, when I first started working in labor, I would not have dreamed of being able to be this casual. But now we are at a point in human events in which, yep, I really like this tweet for April Fool's Day. IATSE, uh, that, that, that's another union that's done a really amazing job of channeling their members' voices and just bringing the humor of them out and being really biting and powerful with their voices. This moment was huge for them, right? You had the Giuliani literally melting down. Here's why you should hire union hair to make up professionals. As someone who plays Dungeons and Dragons, this is particularly close to my heart. So one of the things I hear a lot from organizations is, but we're not funny or cool. Like, how can we have content that people will respond to if we're not funny or cool? And I had that conversation actually with one of the groups I worked with at the start. They were like, oh, this other community organization, they can be snarky. And that's just not us. We, do we have to be snarky? That's not our members. And the answer is no. If you're not snarky, don't be snarky. Like, that would be inauthentic and it wouldn't feel right. Um, what can you do instead? Go back to that worksheet I shared. What are the qualities that describe you or the, or your membership? Like, how do you talk? I realized when I was talking with that group that um, for them, you know, they might not be snarky, but they were very much nurturing. They wanted to make sure everybody had been staying hydrated. Did you get your sun hat before you went to the protest? Bring your water. We'll be out there with you till the day ends. Like, I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. They're your mom. They might not be snarky, but they're your mom. There's other kinds of voices and that are and tones that are can be authentic to your organization without trying to be something you're not. The farm workers account tends not to be snarky, tends to be more just straight up emotional. Um, this is a great one over left. This is depraved. Tyson's Foods 
ordered employees to report to work while supervisors privately wagered money on the number of workers who would be sickened by the deadly virus. And their language that they used in this, the word depraved, crops up in the rest of the press coverage of the story. Um, their uh, We Feed You and Thank a Farm Worker tweets, they have these amazing videos and images that members send of themselves doing their job and just sharing the information about how much work it is to do, what they cost, what they're paid, what the conditions are like. And their members are literally sending them these images all the time. And it comes through their organizing work. It comes through their organizing department. They have these prompts that they give for when people do the video, which is again, you know, what's your name, where you work, why, and for the, this is this when they wanted stuff for Build Back Better, Path to Citizenship. Uh, why it's important for you to have a path to citizenship. Don't give sample scripts develop your questions. And again, it can be off-brand if you're on topic. Uh, historical threads that explain your organizations or your communities or history's voices do really well. Um, get you, you, a lot of us have these beautiful archival old photos we can draw from, telling those stories. And so these are still, these are all storytelling platforms, right? And when you tell these stories, you'll get emotional and real responses from people who see them. Um, the the farm workers union posts about like front like like photos from the field, literally, of workers. We saw a lot of people retweeting them, sharing their own stories. These are, uh, you know, from children of farm workers about what their experience was like growing up. This person retweeted saying, um, thank you, Danielle, and every field worker before you. I remember my parents and I and two sisters sat in that car all day. Hard, hard work. Because um, when you're getting real, other people will get real too, and they'll connect with you. So let's bring this back to that uh, activity, that worksheet I shared before. Um, I want you to start thinking about it. So if you're talking about an organ, if it, let, let, let's talk about the organization that you work for. Um, how would you answer that? Or the organization you're founding? The first thing people notice about me is And um, share that in the chat. It might take a minute, and that's okay. It can even be the first one or two things, but get it right out front. For example, um, I could say that for the Jewish vote, one of the first things people would notice about us is our sort of loud New York Jewish activist tone of voice that we might be using. for Make the Road, you know, the thing with potluck is that Make the Road is always feeding everybody at all of its events. So they could literally answer it with like, we made arroz con carandules because we literally did make that and bring that to the potluck. But let's start with question one for you guys. Or you know what, any of these questions. You got my discussion questions. I want an answer. Don't be shy. I don't think there's that many people in this room. So nobody's going to be like, I think you did the bad job of that. Nerdy. That is right, Christian. Sorry for the car beeping. Hold on. I don't know. Maybe you don't hear it that bad. It's pretty annoying from where I'm sitting. Um, I want to see folks sort of bring this sheet with them to their next conversation that they have around 
organizing strategy as well. Um, because some of those folks are the ones who are really communicating with members and most in touch with them to answer them. I like that, Paola. The first question, I'm small but loud. And that's cool because that's, a, that's embodying a person and it's embodying an organization. You know, like that can be you or that can be where you work. Both of those things are, can be very true. People notice my passion for politics. Um, one piece of framing I actually want to think about is um, when we are bringing out and elevating member voices, um, I want to stay away from language like voicelessness because everyone has a voice and it's more that people with power have chosen to ignore those voices or chosen to pretend they can't hear or see them. Um, so I think shifting, especially like when you're trying to speak in the authentic voice as the organization, you're moving away from talking about as bringing the voice to the voiceless. You're bringing, you're like speaking, you are those people, you are those members and you've never been voiceless. What you have been is systemically um, devalued and you know marginalized, but you will have the voice anyway. And there's the traditions that you have of music, community, and all the ways that people have communicated about those in the past. Um, and, you know, so I think it's important to keep that framework in mind when talking about um, organizing. Uh, and when you're talking, especially like if you're trying to build members, like nobody wants to think of themselves as voiceless either. Um, I think saying things like speaking truth to power can feel like again but um it is another way that people characterize people who are marginalized making sure that the folks with greater power than them hear from them i have an answer from um i help you advocate for change in a trauma-informed way so that's interesting because I think like trauma informed is good for certain audiences and not good for others. And I don't know your audience. So just ask yourself, like, is the audience of people I'm speaking with and as someone who for whom that's language where they're like, I know what that means. Or is it someone who's going to be like, I don't know what that means. Because I have to say, like, we used to tell people all the time, no, don't use jargon ever. In reality, if you're trying to sound like an insider in certain communities, you actually do want to use jargon of those communities because you want to sound like a member of that community. So it's not like no jargon. It's more like right jargon because nothing is there. Nobody's audience is ever everyone. Nobody's ever trying to communicate to everyone. If somebody says that they're they're much they're thinking much too broad. That's not a strategy. So um, with jargon words, just be like. Is, am I using this jargon to connect with the audience of people for whom this jargon is going to be like, yes, this is how I talk about this? Or is it language that might be alienating to the people who we're trying to reach? I literally don't know the answer. And so that is why I put that to you. Um, let's get that movie question going. What movie would we watch together? Or what movie would you host a movie night with your members? And you know, this is something you can do now, to be clear. Um, like online hosting of movie screenings together, I think is an activity that groups should be doing a lot more of now during COVID, even though people are going to the theaters, people are still at home doing it. What are the movies that you guys would watch together that is like the humor, the sadness, the identities that you share? Oh, Ari says the answer for her is Clue. What a classic. I do love it. And I think thinking about the movies that you guys would watch together kind of puts a face to the culture that people are consuming and participating in among the membership. Ah, the latest Filipino rom-com. Are these ones that are like made in the Philippines predominantly? Yeah. 
Um, I got Jerry Maguire as one of the answers. But yeah, I love having like the really specific to the community you're organizing in movie names. Um, you know, I might have them. I do. One second, I can show you this flyer. Hopefully I won't knock over anything. I love these. We did a, there was a whole series of um, cartoon and flyers that a consumer education project did uh, at Make the Road that were all structured like these comic styles that are specific and I love them. Um, that's cool. So yeah, the majority of our members are Filipino women. That's great. Yeah, like knowing what is the exact media that folks are watching and enjoying is so important. And like, you know, have a conversation about the way work or feminism or immigration or any of or cl social class, like even in the least political media, there's always politics there. Um, you know, pulling those threads out and having the conversations about what do people talk about or not talk about. I believe that there was a report from our friends at um, the Opportunity Agenda that showed that the main time that social class and economics are discussed in uh, broadcast TV fiction shows is talking about health care and whether or not people can afford it. And that people don't talk about wealth under anything anything else except for like people characters dealing with with the uh, health care expenses i don't know if you remember that report christian but um i think that like knowing and you could even you could have when your conversation you could even be like in the show they do talk about this but what is it they're not talking about that we as viewers can see and discuss like what are what is the subtext around the economic situations of the people in the media? Ah, from the from the Jerry McGuire suggestion, Jerry fought against the large corporation. He became effective in his own way. You know, I've never seen the movie, so I appreciate having that information. Um, I think like. The movie question, it could be something where it's a movie that you know, folks are all watching from your group. Maybe it aligns with the values in some way, or maybe it doesn't, but there's a way you can talk about it through that lens. Um, I, I think it's important that the you should message me if question is at the end of it, because that is where you go to get the, um, the next step, the step of taking action. You should message me if you want to get involved in our campaign. You should message me if you need help finding X, Y, and Z. Um, you should message me if you want to get to know each other better. Um, but like thinking about that question is sort of where it comes back around to the action steps for the people who you're speaking to. So I, I'm sharing that spreadsheet with folks. You can bring this with you to work on. Hold on, I'm losing my. Uh, I want to pause now just to see what questions folks have. I have um, just a lot of examples and slides lying around, but I want to talk about what your questions are right now. I know it has been a long day. And in, I apologize, you probably are hearing Velcro going on and off. That's me opening and closing various ice packs because this is my life now. So questions could be helping about helping you figure out 
what your organization's answers to some of these questions might be. Um, if there's a social media account that you run that you want me to look at, you can write it out. I can't click on it, but I can like copy it if it's uh, pretty clear to read. Uh, I like this question. Any advice for finding your org's voice if your org is a policy and research nonprofit? I think you can still go to, because I know when I used to work for Policy Shop, our executive director who founded it, she really was the sort of voice and attitude and personification of our work. Um, that might not always be true for your organization. There sure are a lot of organizations out there with white cis het men in charge of them who are trying to sound like that's not who's actually their membership or their leadership. Um, but um, you might find that the, um, that there is that there are literally staff people who are kind of the embodiment of who is speaking for your organization and sort of pushing more content to be literally from them versus from the organization. And from a research standpoint, if you were like a research nonprofit, like what is the thing that you're researching? What movie do people who research that topic watch? You know, like, is there an environment, is it environmental research? Is there like an, is there like a climate related movie that they watch? Are they working on immigration policy? Is there a movie handling that, that they might enjoy? Or it can, doesn't have to be directly linear. Like your favorite movie doesn't have to be about the issue that you work on. Um, the, uh, and to think about also the embodiment of who is the audience you're trying to speak to. I know that with uh, policy shops, every policy shop was like, oh, we're trying to reach everyone. It's not true, you can't reach everyone. Nobody is trying to reach everyone. Who are the people who you're trying to bring your policy proposals to? I know for one of the ones I worked for, it was local level elected officials around the country. So then I'm thinking like, oh, okay, who are the people who are local elected officials? Maybe it's like Leslie Nope, but like not a white lady. Maybe that's who our people, maybe that's who it is. Maybe that's who the embodiment of our audience is. And then I'm gonna go and look at some of the cooler elected officials and some of the older elected officials who might, and some of the younger and some of the more awkward and like kind of get a range of the elected officials you might be trying to speak to and see how they're talking about themselves online and sort of figure out like who, you know, who's your poster child basically. Um, someone asked, um, my organization's members are quite broad as in any US citizen. Um, any US citizen can join the, you know, and any organization, well, not a labor union, but any member, any person can join anything, but that doesn't mean that anybody is the actual membership that you're trying to reach. Um, you know, if you're, you're if you're, any organizer knows that there are specific communities that you're trying to reach or populations that you're trying to organize with that you have identified for strategic reasons. Um, you may have decided that it's mothers who live in a particular state because they care about this particular issue, but haven't been mobilized behind it yet. And so then maybe you're like, oh, okay, I'm a mom in Wisconsin. That's who I am now. Like, but what is that? Um, but like for any, this is, so th this is, this is really is a point that I think goes beyond the question of authentic voices and goes to your actual organizing strategy. Cause these things are aligned, right? Is like, you have to be able to say who you're trying to organize. And then from there, you can build this persona from it, but, but, but nobody's trying to organize everybody. That's just not, even if everybody can join, that doesn't mean that's the actual targeted audience you're trying to move to reach your goal. How can you find your voice if your organization has a broad audience and followers? I think one place to start is to consider which group of followers are on which platform. If you find that there's a generational difference between who's on which platform for you guys, as is often the case, that can be a starting point. Because remember, it doesn't have to be exactly consistent across all the platforms, right? Nobody's like spot checking that your tweets and your Facebook posts are saying the exactly the same thing and using the same GIFs. That's not a thing. Um, but think about who are the members that are on those different platforms. Um, think about 
which of the audiences you're trying to speak to, you're trying to reach more, like who is more of the focus of your organizing plan? Because I might know that we have a lot of members all over the country, but ultimately the people I need to mobilize live in New York. So I'm gonna focus with, on New Yorkers. Um, and I think it can also be possible to have more than one sort of avatar that you're thinking of for your group. And it might be, it changes a little bit depending on the specifics of the issue, time or place. Um, Christiane is asking, how much should you engage in a good show with a good message when the actor in the show has a problematic history? Well, I think that is a question about, because like actors and producers and every, I mean, there's problematic people everywhere. I, I personally would say that if there's, if there's, if there's like currently people talking about how you shouldn't watch that show because X, Y, and Z, then you don't want to do it. But if the conversation around it hasn't gotten to that point, I think it's good to join in and to acknowledge the ways in which this particular person may have caused harm and not to hide from that, but to have that be part of the conversation that you're having. That's not to say you ever wanna show up in a fan space and be like, hey, my name's Ilana and your fandom is problematic and you stink and you should all be embarrassed. Like that's not, I know you know not to do that, Christian, but I'm just saying this to all listeners, you know, showing up and being a wet blanket is never a successful strategy. Um, but you can say like, you know, how much, I just had a personal example just the other day and I'm blanking on it. Um, but like, you know, I love watching this. It's a shame that Bob is still in it and hasn't been replaced by Brian, by a CG, by a CGI version of Brian Cox. However, da -da -da -da. like you can still acknowledge those problems. I think the where it becomes more of a job for you to not engage with is if this is a social, if this is a show that a lot of people don't care about and you're bringing attention to a thing that isn't popular yet, then you are popularizing it and that wouldn't be helpful. But if people are already talking about it and it's already popular, you're not like making it more popular um, unless you are a very big organization with a huge platform. And when it comes to speaking critically about shows and books and stuff like that, that, that people have fandoms, you will find that some of the biggest fans of them have had some of the most nuanced and critical analysis of them. And so you can follow their critiques, tones, and leads when talking about it. Um, because any like really robust fandom like is going to have already had a detailed, rich conversation about um, the problems with the writer or the narrative or something like that. Um, Alice asking, should we find a poster child for each population we are trying to reach? Um, I think that can be a good starting point, but you don't want to sound like too many different people in the same place. Um, oftentimes you can, you can connect a particular person voice with a particular campaign. So when we're talking about the student mobilization project, it's going to be a student, right? And if we're talking about um, the healthcare worker mobilization project, it might be a healthcare worker. So thinking the clearer it is why a particular person might be your poster child that you're envisioning yourself speaking as for that particular campaign, the better off you are with it. Um, and I think usually you can tie it to a particular person, to a particular aspect of the work that you're doing. And maybe once you have those established in your mind, having them bring them in, bringing them into conversation with each other could be really powerful and interesting too. Have the intergenerational conversation happening. And that I'm speaking about that both in a literal and metaphorical sense. These are really good questions, you guys. So keep it coming in. Mm. I will say that um, Christiane's question about, you know, talking with fans in a show that has a problematic message or history or something um, is something I cover a lot in my fan activism trainings that I do. Um, I'm not sure when I'm going to offer one next, but I will, that will be coming. And um, I'm going to be teaching a class in narrative strategy with Felicia Perez, formerly of the Center for Story-Based Strategy, this winter that I'd love to get folks signed up for. 
where's my slides i'm gonna advance to my questions and answer slide but um yeah so the trainings i have coming up are online fundraising which literally starts next week it takes place on two different days um and it is for anyone who's trying to raise money for their organization online um i have digital best practices training which i consider to be the sort of building blocks for any organization's digital strategy we cover email writing um social media content strategy ad platforms and pulling it all together into a coherent campaign so it's not just random ad hoc tactics that you're looking at that's going to be offered in December. Doing my online organizing training in the winter, uh, especially with a focus on developing meaningful online actions as opposed to completely bullshit online actions. Sorry, I this this wheel is not great with my hand. And we're going to have a training on using graphics in your strategy more effectively because I see so many groups doing great things with substandard graphics. We'd like to help you get your get your house in order on that front. Um, do you have any advice for someone who made the mistake of making a work Twitter and a personal Twitter? I did this and now my personal is 8,000 more followers than my work one. Of course it does, because people want to follow you as a person instead of the organizational account. Um, I think, congratulations, your personal Twitter is now both, right? If there's anything that you tweeted from your personal one that is like vastly inappropriate, purge it. Um, but um, I can know for me, and this has been true for my account since the birth of my account, basically of all of the um, things that, there's just so few things that I posted from my personal account that I could even see somebody having a legitimate concern to, to raise. Because um, it's not official, but I am talking about our work. And in my bio, you know, when I worked for Make the Road New York, I did not have Make the Road New York's handle in my Twitter bio. But if you were paying attention, you could tell I worked there because I'd be tweeting up how cool their stuff was all the time. And I, in a way that said us rather than they. Um, so your your personal Twitter account is your, is your, is your work Twitter account now. But I think the fact that it has 8,000 more followers than your work one really does speak to the point of how much more powerful it is when you're speaking as an individual in your own voice um, and bridging those things together. I'd love to uh, keep an eye on both of your accounts, by the way. Oh, thank you, Christian. He was asking about my Doom Patrol podcast, which I'm taping tomorrow. So... Um, But tell me, Paula, if my if my response feels like something that's actionable to you, or if I just gave you advice where you're like, I don't understand, or I can't do it, or like, let me know how that feels. Yes, she is going to scrub the personal one before I make it public. Definitely go ahead and scrub things, but remember, don't scrub, don't scrub out your personality. Like we can talk about the, you know, you might want to scrub the like, I'm so pissed at my mom today, but you don't even have to. Like you legitimately don't even have to. You might want to scrub the I'm so drunk or whatever, but you don't want to scrub out the emotion, the feeling, the personality from it. Um, I think in past years, there was a lot more social, um, stigma against people expressing feelings, emotion of any kind in a professional context. And I used to be worried to tweet about my feelings on Twitter. I was, used to always say, I tweet about what I think, my opinions, I tweet my reviews, I tweet like live tweet the Black Sabbath concert I'm at, but I don't tweet my feelings. And in recent years, you know, mostly people who are younger than me have just been out there feeling their feelings and tweeting them out. And now I'm like, yeah, actually, I kind of do feel comfortable saying these things in those spaces now. Um, and if any future employer decides that they don't want to hire me because I expressed having anxiety and dealing with that, then like, I don't know, that sounds like an ADA suit to me. Um, so um, I think you don't need to get rid of emotion, feelings, fear, joy. I, I 
imagine that you probably don't have to per to scrub that many things. One thing I really recommend for young people is you probably if who were on Twitter when they were young is you probably said some dumb shit when you were young. Go back and delete the like stuff that you wrote before you had greater political education and sensitivity than you do today. Um, but there's probably not as much stuff that needs to go as you think as you think does. How would, okay, great question is, how would you recommend giving some of the keys to the organization's voice, i.e. if you need to designate another staffer to cover social media for you? So one thing is if this is for a short term piece, you're going to give them the login and then change the login when the day is over. So like for the new, for the um, Make the Road Nevada account, when they have a Twitter take, an Instagram takeover from a member, they make it have a really simple password for that day and then change it back to the more secure password at the end of the day. Um, and you also can just, if it, when it, with Instagram, it has to be like them posting themselves because of the way the format works. But for Twitter, you don't necessarily have to give them the login if for some reason you don't want to. You can have them message you short statements, be like, you got 280 characters or less, kids, you know, and have you post those directly yourself. I'm not sure if I've answered your question, though, Christiane, so tell me if I did. I don't know if you meant like from a technical standpoint or, I mean, the other thing to be aware of is if you give straight up or giving somebody else access to posts from your account, make sure they're trained in the basics of doing Twitter well or the basics of doing Facebook well or whatever platform it is. Um, I mean, one of the cool things with Facebook is that you can have people with different permissions settings on it. So I can have some people who can do a live stream as us, but they can't like moderate our messages, for example. Ah, Christian was saying, I was also thinking about if you were too busy to post on social media, I needed someone else to post. I mean, I think the starting point is making sure that they're educated in the voice and tone and have actually spent time looking and reading the account. Um, and I, I would also go to a point I, at least I hope I made earlier, which is like, look, not every single post we do is going to be optimal. It's not always going to be the best voice, the catchiest thing. It might We might fall into robot voice at some points in time. But... Uh, you can always try again. And every viral success that you have makes it easier for the next thing you post to be seen. So my friend at um, Farm Workers said that she had posted a quick video about um, a, do a dog bringing home a cow to play. And it's kind of was like, this seems sort of off message, but it's like, no, it's actually not because we're farm union. And so cows are actually very much on brand. And that tweet performed really well for them. And then the next day they had a very cut and dry um, newsy tweet and it overperformed. And that was because basically everybody who commented on their cute tweet the day before was then sent their more dry tweet the day after because the Twitter algorithm. So it pays off to have had that other content when you're trying to uh, show the vegetables as it were. But, oh, yeah, but, but to your, your question, Christian, I think getting people oriented to spend time really looking and reading the account is important and teaching them, you know, the basics of social media strategy so that they don't do things that they shouldn't be doing while you're gone. But in terms of conveying the voice, if you do that handout, share the handout with them. Um, Juana asks, how do you keep your authentic voice consistent when multiple staff members post on your accounts throughout the day? I mean you want to have a conversation with them about what that voice should sound like. Um, but it's also okay if it's not like, it's not going to always be perfectly consistent and that's sort of understood. Um, if you have two different people who sound very different from each other, but are both representative of the organization, but and they're both individual staff people, maybe some of them initial their tweet to say who they want to reach or who they are, sorry. You know, I know some electeds will sometimes have staff people initial which ones are them versus which ones are the elected themselves. Um, oh, Ari, can you share my sign up form for my upcoming digital bliss practices training in the chat? Bam, taking applicants for this still. So good place to get started on developing these digital skills. And as always, all of our upcoming trainings will be on the new media mentors website. 
And the online fundraising training is right over there. I have a, a few more spaces left in that, but not many. So please do apply for that fast if you'd like to join us for it. Um, my friend who works with parents together who had that really great uh, video example we showed earlier is going to be one of the people is my co-trainer with that. So go get them, comrades. As you know, here once said. I really love that tweet. It's a good gif. It's a good meme. Any last questions before we close? It's a great one there. And look, they came a long way. When I first worked there, I had to get every tweet I posted cleared through the legal department, even though legal has nothing to do with any of these kinds of things. And now that's not relevant. I, um, you know, basically made the case to the organization, like I did, like I explained to in the beginning of our training, we're not going to be effective on this platform unless we can speak in a rapid format. So let's establish some guidelines of the kinds of things I can say and the kinds of things I can't say. And developing the organizational voice can be a part of setting that up. Like you can determine, like, how do we talk? Do we curse? But if there's one thing that you need to do, it is to not sound like a robot, not sound like a press release, not be overly formal not speak in nonprofit ease and just be your wonderful, innovative, powerful self. So have a good night, you guys. Thank you. And if you want to reach me, um, you can contact me through the new media mentors website or just uh, email me at Ilana, sorry, Ilana at netrootsnation.org.